Greetings, everyone. This is Peg Bray at NOAA Fisheries in Silver Spring. Welcome to the NOAA Ecosystem-Based Management, Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Management seminar series. This is the sixth in our series, which has become extremely popular, and uh, we appreciate everyone joining us today. We know we're covering a couple of time zones here, so we really appreciate uh, people joining us at those various times. Uh, today, we're lucky to have Rusty Brainerd from our Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center. He's been there for a number of years, and he heads up our Habitat and Living Marine Resources Program at the Science Center there. And prior to that, he was founded the Coral Reef Ecosystem Program. Rusty's going to talk to us today about the science that is being developed there that, that supports ecosystem-based management efforts, and specifically in the context of coral reef ecosystems across the Pacific Island region. Obviously, you can see by his title slide, he has a lot of folks that have contributed to this endeavor, and I uh, want to thank all those folks for their efforts and uh, thank Rusty. Our next in the series is, again, the second Wednesday of the month in the afternoon here in Eastern Time. And that'll be Howard Townsend from our NOAA Fisheries Office here at Oxford, Maryland, will be joining us. And he will be uh, giving us an in-depth study uh, or overview of the ecosystem modeling efforts that um, Howard has been undertaking and in support of our efforts here at, e at NOAA Fisheries. So again, thanks to Rusty and his team. And uh, thanks to the NOAA Library uh, for support supporting and hosting this. Uh, Judith has been a great, great uh, help here. Uh, what we'll do is we'll go through the, Rusty will go through the presentation from his location in Honolulu, and then uh, we'll, we'll take uh, comments or questions uh, either through the chat, correct, Judith? Yes, and either, then, either uh, in the question panel or chat, or we can unmute you if you'd like to ask Rusty directly. Directly. And I'll be on hand to answer the chat during the webinar if you have any questions. Well, thank you, everyone. And Rusty, I'll turn this over to you. You have the screen and you have the floor. Well, aloha and thank you, uh, Peg and Judith, for organizing this. <clears throat> I appreciate the, the the entire series. I've enjoyed the the first uh, uh, four of the series that that I was able to watch and have uh, some some uh, some big shoes to fill in following that. I'm going to be shifting those discussions uh, really towards the science to support ecosystem-based management and ecosystem-based fisheries management uh, for coral reef ecosystems, which is a, a, a sub part of what we do in the Pacific Islands. Um, and because it's near shore, uh, much of what I'll be talking about is, is very much ecosystem-based management um, with a subset being ecosystem-based fisheries management. Uh, you've already kind of acknowledged some of the key authors and, and I'd also like to highlight the, and many others are involved with what I'm going to be presenting. It's not just the authors uh, are shown. Um, during this talk, I'm, I'm really going to cover two things. The, the, the first, and arguably maybe the most important, is really the why coral reefs are important and why ecosystem-based management, ecosystem-based fisheries management important. The, the, the second part of the, the talk, uh, and it, it, the, the longer part, but is the science to support that in the Pacific Islands region. And I really, I'm not gonna go through all of the agenda here, but I really wanna highlight that the, the different components are all building blocks. It's not like you're, you're doing ecosystem-based management if you're doing this, or that you have to do all of these things. These are all integrated and interconnected and in, like science itself, building blocks that we keep working towards improving. So kind of starting with the why, it really comes down to the people. We're, we're, these, this series of photos that you're seeing are from one morning walk that I took in, in a fishing village. And, and as you can see from the photos, there's, there's young people, old people, uh, male, female, and all different users of these marine resources. Um, and then that's really why we want to go to ecosystem-based management is for sustainability of the resources that those people depend on. And the bio, the, that's the biodiversity. Um, so for coral reefs, the, those resources provide jobs through livelihoods from fishing and tourism. Uh, they provide uh, recreational opportunities and cultural experiences uh, for people, particularly valuable in our region, Pacific Islands region. They provide coastal protection. Uh, they also kind of just in an economic term, coral reef ecosystems uh, uh, per area are the highest economic value habitat or biome of all of the, the marine habitats. And I'm showing some numbers. I won't highlight those uh, too much here, but showing some just economic study uh, figures. And those are all, like any studies are a little bit debatable, but in either case, it's a very large economic values. Those are shown some, some values for Hawaii, 
and then nationally from, from some of these studies. But the, the, the point is, is that they have tremendous values for people. So the, 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 in, a, in a nutshell, people are often uh, confused and confounded by ecosystem-based management. I, I try to start with really, it's, it's a very simple thing of just trying to balance ecological well-being with human well-being through good governance. And, and obviously, that's easier to say than to do. The challenge is to do it, is to do that good governance piece. But we're really trying to, to balance trade-offs of, of human uses of, of these ecosystems and to reduce risks so that we can have sustainable systems for future generations. So as, as part of some work uh, a bunch of us have been doing for a number of years in Southeast Asia with colleagues at FAO and the large, uh, the Bay of Bengal Large Marine Ecosystem Project and part of the Coral Triangle Initiative, we, we built some kind of materials to help uh, communicate ecosystem-based management, fisheries management. I'm gonna show a cartoon that kind of we developed for that work. So in this is a couple of villages, uh, side by side, small villages. and. And what we're going to highlight in these slides is that they really need to co-manage across. So if one village is, is mismanaging their local resources, that will affect the resources of their adjacent village. And you can draw all kinds of other political boundaries, whether those be between different islands or between different provinces or different states uh, on the mainland um, or uh, uh, marine protected areas or parks. There's, there's different political jurisdictions, so they're purposely not labeled here. Uh, the, the point is, is that the fishery resources and the biological resources cross those political lines that, that, that we as a society put on them. So we need to manage across these boundaries as well, which, which means we need to kind of co-manage. The users of these resources also cross these different boundaries from, from the villages maybe using small, small boats or shore-based fishing to some that go just within bottom fish depths to others that are distant water fisheries. There's other users of these systems like merchant shipping, a transportation of, of cargo uh, globally, or ecotourism shown here by kayaks and, and divers. Um, there's there's uh, other users like uh, coastal development, our big cities, or our small cities, or our communities, and then those have impacts on, on the nearshore system. Uh, there's, there's other things like mining, or shown here as as uh, oil extraction or things like that. There's, there's agriculture that, that changes land use patterns and that affects the nearshore system. Uh, we, we convert land often for pasture land and that has impacts to the marine system. So, so this looks like it's all very complex and, and the reality is uh, in a science sense it, it, it is complex, but if we keep going back to that simple thing we're trying to do is, is balance our decision making by balancing these, these, these trade-offs uh, of uses. So that's why we think an ecosystem-based approach is the most important, an ecosystem-based approach for fisheries management within our agency. And then this, this uh, overlay is kind of, in addition to all of these local effects that are occurring that are affecting these systems and, and fisheries management, we have climate change and these global changes that are affecting marine populations in, in significant ways. And those need to be managed as well. And we need to make our management decisions at local levels with the understanding of these larger scale processes. So kind of in a nutshell, we need to co-manage across these various kind of political boundaries as well as sector boundaries. So EBFM is the fisheries sector for EBM. And within NOAA Fisheries, our big role is, is ecosystem-based fish fisheries management. But we need to be communicating with our partners in, in the agencies, whether they be state or other federal agencies or other stakeholders that are having influences on the system that we manage. So another cartoon, and again, trying to, um, trying to go from what's a very complex scientific system, ecological system, to take away the myth that, that has been, kind of scared people away from ecosystem-based management for a long time is that you have to know everything about everything before you can do anything. We, we don't buy that argument. <clears throat> we, we actually, on a, in reality, is you, you need to implement ecosystem-based management with the best available science that you have and then iteratively improve that science through an adaptive management process. So many have used kind of this planning, doing, uh, checking and improving adaptive management uh, process for, for fisheries management, 
uh, for, and for other forms of management. It's a very simple process of continuing to identify your goals and your priorities, develop a plan, implement the plan, see how the actions that you're doing are working, and then adapt it, and adapt it with more science. And I guess I would argue is that, that science is actually involved in all of the stages of this adaptive management process. Within NOAA Fisheries, we, we came up with the EBFM uh, guiding principles as, as part of the roadmap in, in the, the EBFM uh, policy. And again, I'm not going to, this is particularly with this audience, you, you've gone through this uh, and each of the other talks have gone through So I'm not going to reread all of these. I guess my argument here is that all of these components of the EBFM uh, guiding principles, and I would carry that those, even those EBFM, all of those I think carry over to EBM as well. And all of them require good science, and that's adaptive science, to, to listen, to adapt to the, what science we do to meet the needs of improving management. So that's kind of the first part. So I'm going to go to the actual science for the, in the Pacific Islands that we're doing uh, to, to support ecosystem-based management. And again, the reminder is that these are some examples of the steps and the, the foundation of the science that we provide. They're all interconnected in ways, but it, it, it's not a, a must-do recipe list that you have to do this and this and this and this. For our region, we think these are very important examples. Uh, so starting with benthic habitat mapping, we use various tools from satellites to multi-beam sonars to optical methods so that then when we can characterize and classify the habitats that, that structure the populations that we manage, whether those be corals, whether they be fishery resources, whether they be protected resources, we, we need to know where they are so that we can more effectively manage it. That structures the science and the monitoring that we're doing to know where we need to do what. And these are just tools. So the, it's less here about what we're doing, but we need to have good maps to, 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 to serve as that foundation of our science and our management. The next is the, the kind of interdisciplinary ecosystem monitoring of, of various components. For the coral reef work that, that I'm describing here, a lot of the foundation for that is, is NOAA's National Coral Reef Monitoring Program, or NCRAMP. In the Pacific Islands region, uh, we implement that and have since uh, 2000 as the Pacific Reef Assessment and Monitoring Program, or Pacific RAMP. So that's a long-term monitoring, monitoring of the, of the condition, the diversity, abundance, and distribution of fishes and corals and vertebrates, and, and the, the ecological components, as well as the, the physical and chemical drivers that are supporting those systems. Uh, through lots of discussions and decisions, we do that at a kind of a wide but thin approach, meaning we're looking at all of the reefs of the U.S. Pacific Islands on a three-year basis. We've been doing this work for the past 18 years, uh, and we're using the same repeatable method so we can monitor in a robust way changes over time. We use multiple methods uh, to do this work uh, from, from uh, random fixed sites for our benthic surveys and our fish surveys to toad diver surveys, which provide significant spatial area. Um, from those types of things, we can get uh, things, uh, all kinds of products. Some simple examples are the uh, upper plot is island means and variances uh, for uh, fish biomass uh, on the reefs by island. So there's uh, 35 or 40 islands along the, the bottom axis there. And you can see some islands like on the, the left are have very high uh, fish biomass. And if you go down to the right, uh, very low fish biomass. Similarly, we can do that for any species of fish. Our variances go up as we go to the species level or, or family level. But in total biomass, this is the pattern. But we can do that for everything. We have everything by size so that we can compute biomass. Similarly, for coral cover and many other benthic indices, we can come up with these island scale uh, changes. Uh, this next figure I'm showing, I'm personally very excited by this. This is something that uh, Tom Oliver in our shop just produced last Friday. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of information actually in this figure, um, which will probably continue to evolve. But what this is, is the upper figure that the, the, my mouse is on now is mean coral cover from all years. We've done eight years of surveys at Palmyra Atoll from our toad diver surveys, which go all the way around. Tom also added in all of our fixed site surveys. So this is an integration of all of our data by, by 400 meter grids around the entirety of this large atoll system both inside the lagoon as well as the, the four reef habitat. If you go over to the right by sector, so say the north sector is this entire four reef all the way from one end to the other, the south sector is from that end to there, and then there's these other two sectors. 
It's actually plotted all of the data along these sectors, you know, by year. So these are the years, if you can't see that, 2002, 2004, 2006, et cetera, and then plotted trends by sector. And then this bottom figure is actual long-term decadal trend in coral cover. So here we can see some areas have actually been increasing. These blue areas have been increasing coral cover over this 15-year period. Other areas have decreasing coral cover. When you get to populated islands, knowing where these changes, these spatial patterns and temporal patterns is really important for them making, man, the local managers making decisions about how they move forward. An another example of something we're going to to improve our methods, this is some work we pioneered with Scripps Institution of Oceanography, uh, Stuart Sandin's group, is, is doing three-dimensional photo mosaics. And what's in this is some colors in this, in this figure are, are classifying certain types of corals in this. And we're working towards actually switching that over to where instead of having people annotate these images, we're trying to get it to where we can train computers to do that to save significant cost and improve repeatability of these, these measurements. Um, we're, I, I mentioned that in addition to the biological resources, we're, we're monitoring the effects of climate, environmental variability, ocean acidification and ocean warming in particular. We can't do everything everywhere. So we, we've come up with a grid or a, a hierarchical pattern from class zero and class one sites. We're looking at the chemistry and the temperature at all of the, island, all of the US islands. Uh, to some class two sites where we're looking at the biological response, but those we're only doing on a three-year rotation. And then right now at only one site in, on Oahu, we're looking at continuous measurements of the carbonate chemistry at those sites. We plan to expand those, but still that'll be very limited. And this is driven by costs and reality. So it's, it's a hierarchical scale. So as an example of a class zero is we do water chemistry of this cartoon island. We do water chemistry around an entire island we have temperature recorders on four sides of the island at four different depths. So that's a class zero or class one site. We're getting the, chemist, the temperature and the chemistry. Uh, a class two site, which we have four of in each locate, in each island or each archipelago, we, we also are looking at the biological response. We deploy a bunch of instruments on four sides of the island. Those are in climate sites. And from that kind of information, we can now map by island and by region, things like the carbonate chemistry, how ocean acidification, what are the measurements in different regions, which had never been done before. We're also looking at the ecological response. This is calcification rates accumulating on, on, on things we call cows, calcification uh, accretion units that we deploy for three years and then just may uh, measure and weigh how much calcium carbonate has been produced in that three year period. Tom Oliver in our shop has taken all of that that accretion rate data and modeled that against um, saturation state on the bottom. And, and the, the, although the black circles in the background are the actual measurements, and you can see it at high saturation states, we have high um, accretion rates. And as you get lower saturation states, you have lower accretion rate. You can actually model that in terms of mean uh, climate conditions that have occurred. So the, the high levels are kind of representative of what coral reefs were feeling in the 1860s, pre-industrial. And we're on this trajectory as saturation states continue to go down with ocean acidification, the ability of these reef systems to continue to accrete and to, to survive uh, continues to decline. Another major threat that we're monitoring is, is ocean warming and, and increased instances of, of coral bleaching, shown here as, as an example of an extreme bleaching event at Jarvis Island, right in the center of uh, the, the largest El Nino we've ever measured in the, in the central equatorial Pacific, which ended out with a 98% coral mortality at that small island. So now we're trying to understand the process. How does a, a system that has that much mortality, how does it recover? What is the resilience of, of a system like that? Uh, so, so another thing that we've been working on is, is developing, and this is also just in a review stage right now, but for each of the region, the archipelagos across the Pacific islands, uh, Tom and, and Jeff Maynard and, and, and many others have developed these coral reef resilience indices for each of the islands across the Pacific, both for the reef resiliency, uh, the exposure to climate change, but also with colleagues looking at the social vulnerability. So you look at the insides, there's certain areas within these islands that have different human vulnerabilities to, to climate change. So we're, we're developing those products to help understand. Uh, another product that because coral reefs, in addition to climate change and fishing that they're impacted by, they're also impacted by these land-based activities. That's that early cartoon. 
So Joey Leckie and colleagues is part of the West Hawaii Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Project and the Ocean Tipping Points Project that developed a whole bunch of different layers. I think there's 20 different layers for all of the main Hawaiian islands. I'm gonna show a couple of examples of that that are now available on the PACIU's website spatially around every island. I've, I've chosen Oahu. So this is the, the impact of development um, on your nearshore systems and kind of jumping to the next of habitat, where, where are areas where humans have modified in a significant way the habitats. Another example is effluent from cesspools and, um, and, and septic tanks. Um, and these are just examples. And then also, and Joey's also created time series of these. So this is again, the, the septic tanks example, going from 2000 up to 2015, you can, you can see this steady increase of, of these, these uh, dispo sewage disposal systems at the site level, and there's significant um, portion of this enters the nearshore system and that affects reefs. So this helps management by knowing where these things are occurring. So these are just some of the tools. Joey's also looked at the commercial catch uh, of, of fish as well as the recreational catch. The point isn't on this talk isn't to go through every one of these data sets, but to, to have you all know that these are various tools we use to implement ecosystem-based management, ecosystem-based fisheries management, and they're now becoming widely available uh, on the web. So that's kind of the kind of the monitoring components to inform things. I'm going to next talk about some of the work that we do on reef fishes and more on kind of the ecosystem-based fisheries management component. Um, I showed you a little bit of our fish surveys. So this is some work that Ivar Williams published in, in 2015. We're based on all of the data that we have from observations. Uh, the gray bars here are what we model is what a particular, based on primarily on productivity and represented here as chlorophyll, uh, but all the other drivers and, and what, how much fish biomass an island should be able to produce based on its oceanographic environment. That's what the gray bars. And you can see, you can see there's a, a, a fair amount of variability and uncertainty in that. The islands on the, and these are islands on the left. The, the ones on the left are uninhabited islands and they're plotted by, by productivity. So the, the, these are the equatorial upwell islands, upwelling islands on the left. They produce tremendous biological productivity and they have high fish biomass which is our observations are these colored bars by, by trophic gills. Um, and, and then you, you, you see in the populated islands, these are now sorted by increasing human population from places with very few people uh, on one end to the far right, places with a million people like Oahu. And, and the difference of what, the, what we predict should be produced based on just biological productivity of these places is these gray bars. And you, you can see We've had human human impacts, and this isn't just fishing. This is fishing. This is land-based or this is the, the total things. This is what we observe of fish, and this is what we predict of fish. Um, so again, this is a tool that helps us manage many of these same data as well as, well as the fishery data. Mark Daydon of the Science and the Stock Assessment Program took took the data, which has length data as well as the the, the, the catch data, and in, in 2015 published a method um, using and a, a way to derive a stock assessment based on length of these fishes. Um, and then in 2016 and, and 17, uh, um, got, an got an approved stock assessment for 27 species of reef fishes in the main Hawaiian Islands. This is the first ever for a, a data poor fishery where we, that we've been able to produce a stock assessment that is now su supporting the management decision for those resources. It's another example of the use. Most of what I've talked about so far has been the shallow reef, zero to 30 meters based on diving surveys. We're, we're using various methods, uh, camera systems, uh, video systems, uh, mouse systems to look at deeper depths. Uh, Jake Asher has published several papers. I'm not gonna go into all the details of those either here, but these populations of the deep fishes are also structuring uh, by themselves by habitat and depth. So now we have some, some science that supports which, which resources are utilizing which habitats. Our protected species division and our fishery research and monitoring division have also been looking at some management actions or options for management that can be done. Uh, John Wang provided this, and and in order to decrease by, uh, bycatch of protected resources like turtles or, or sharks or seabirds, they're uh, for gill nets that are caught in in uh, as bycatch in, in gill nets. They're lighting these nets with with LEDs, and what they're seeing is a significant reduction in the bycatch with minimal or no effect on the target resources and the value of those resources. Another example of how applying science to 
to help this ecosystem-based fisheries management process. Another tool that ecosystem-based managers often use is place-based management, both for ecosystem-based fisheries management and ecosystem-based management. And I'm gonna show some examples of some of those that we're using in the Pacific Island. Again, not uh, an exhaustive list, but the, the first is, is kind of a very small scale example uh, from uh, 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 the small port in the upper left, you see a small area of coastline on, on Maui, and it's only three kilometers long. So it's a very small area. But the, the, the picture, so this is, this is a highly touristed, well-developed area. This is uh, Lahaina, Kanapali area of Maui. Um, and you see coral, this figure in the middle has coral cover dropping. And if it were just the coral cover dropping from kind of 50 something percent to 30 something percent, it probably wouldn't have been an outcry. But what happened is when the coral cover dropped, it was, it was replaced. They outcompeted by uh, macroalgae. And that probably wouldn't have bothered that many people. But that macroalgae was suddenly showing up on all these beaches. And people didn't like all this algae on their beaches. Um, so then it became a big deal. We need to deal with this because that was affecting the economy of these places. People will, uh, I'd rather go to a beach that doesn't have all these flies and, and algae on it. So the state instituted the Kahakili Herbivore Fishery Management Area. Because uh, in an ecosystem way, corals and algae are continually competing for real estate on the bottom. The herbivores are eating that algae and are kind of controlling that balance between coral and algae. Well, the, the algae were starting to win that balance so the, the state, and, and what now is being used as a model, instituted a prohibition in the take of the herbivores, but allowing other fishing, which is one of the advantages that it, it's still allowed fishing, whereas a lot of MPAs have been a lot of resistance from the fishing communities because it was no take. This approach allowed continued uh, fishing to occur, but targeted fishing only. Uh, and then we, so we've been working with the state to monitor that since 2000, and that was that was established in 2009. So this is the biomass of the of, of the of, of a, a couple of examples uh, of, of the herbivores uh, shown here as parrotfish, with a over 300 percent increase in parrotfish biomass uh, over the ensuing years, and surgeon fish, a smaller uh, herbivore of 71 percent. You can also see the sizes of these fish initially. The, the parrot fishes were all in very small, small size classes. Now we're getting back to much more of a natural and sustainable uh, population of those species. And then we're also seeing um, you, you, we were in a declining period of coral cover of the benthos that was starting to stabilize. We had some the mass coral bleaching events in 14 and 15. Um, we, we, we think it may have been worse. We don't know that with certainty. What we do know is that the macroalgae, the green line here, has declined since that uh, ban took a place and the crustose coral and algae, which is kind of a settlement queue for corals, has increased. So it seems to be that the approach is working. Uh, I'm not gonna have much time here, but we've also been kind of looking at, not every herbivore is the same. Adele Heenan studied some things on, on looking at different groups of herbivores and did some generalized additive model of different drivers, human drivers, environmental drivers, high island, low island, uh, to, to see what those patterns are to inform management. Are there certain herbivores that we should manage? I mentioned earlier a lot of these kind of land-based sources of pollution effects. That, that same area of, of West Maui is this particular example. Uh, Bernardo Vargas and Hell has worked with USGS and, and a lot of local partners to better understand the land management issues. And, and for decades, there's been impactful land use parts of this part of Maui, primarily uh, agriculture, where they, they cleared a lot of fields, uh, started the, the sugarcane industry from, and pineapple industry for many years, and then there's also that extensive tourism along there, and those watershed changes have had impacts of the nearshore reef system. So we're now providing information to help better manage that. Kind of other large-scale examples, those are very small-scale examples of place-based management. Large-scale examples are the West Hawaii Integrated Ecosystem Assessment. So, you know, rather than three kilometers like Kahakili, the West Hawaii is, is the entire west side of, of the island of Hawaii. So more like 140 uh, kilometers of, of coastline or a linear coastline. Um, and then that work is producing a lot of ecosystem indicators, a lot of efforts to inform local management conservation of West Hawaii. At an even larger scale, uh, we're working we, in somewhat unique to our region as we have these large uh, Pacific Marine National Monuments uh, like, like the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, Papanaumokuakea, or the Pacific Remote Islands, or Marianas Trench. 
And those kind of become, because there's never really been fishing in those active fishing, particularly the reef systems, there aren't land-based sources of pollution, there aren't these other human, they become kind of natural laboratories for us to understand the impacts of climate change on marine ecosystems. So that's kind of the, the fish side. On the protected species side, we're also, you know, one of the things that, that we, we worked on for, for a couple of years was, was providing the science to support the decision on whether to list or not list uh, coral species. And then after a, a about a four year process and partly informed by a, a status review report of a, from a petition that initially petitioned 83 species of coral. So the largest petition our agency has ever received. We did a status assessment, a risk assessment, extinction risk assessment for 82 of those species in this you know, 530 page report that looked and evaluated the extinction risk by the year 2100 and, and ranked the magnitude of the threats. And then the biggest threats were really climate related in terms of extinction. Locally, there's, there's, that's a very different balance. But that led to the listing of 20 decisions. We're now 20 species as vulnerable under, under ESA. We're now working to provide science to, to help the recovery process of those species across the region. Uh, so the, the the next part is kind of use of and, and one of the tools for ecosystem-based management. Again, not knowing we will never know everything about everything. So we're trying to get to where we have indicators that that synthesize complex ecosystem information in, in ways that are useful as thresholds or tools to support management. So so show a couple of examples, and this is a couple slides uh, from our uh, Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council and. You know, one of the things they're really working on is National Standard One under under Magnuson, and and one of the things is is to include guidance on incorporating ecosystem consideration into into our stock assessment information. They've also outlined various activities or things that we need to improve our understanding of to support ecosystem-based fisheries management from a council perspective. We've already shifted towards uh, fishery ecosystem plans across the region. If you go to in those, uh, and these for, for our region, those are archipelagos. So there's the Marianas Archipelago Fishery uh, Ecosystem Plan, uh, Hawaiian Archipelago Fishery Ecosystem Plan, Ameri or, uh, American Samoa, Samoa, well, actually my, one of those is mislabeled, see right now. Uh, one of those is Samoa and one for the Pacific Remote Islands. And every year there's, there's stock assessment fisheries evaluations that we all refer to as the SAFE reports. Those all include a, a chapter on ecosystem considerations and the climate considerations. So similar to the adaptive management process that I outlined at the beginning, that's really what the council does as well. They come up with their fishery ecosystem plan, they monitor primarily through us in monitoring of the fisheries themselves, uh, update the annual safe report, make amendments to the fishery plans, and through that adaptive management process, they, they continue, again, very akin to what's proposed under EBFM. Some other indicators we've been dabbling with uh, really since 2008 from the reef perspective in, in, uh, in uh, these two reports, uh, which are kind of summary uh, booklets of conditions. We take a lot of information of the benthos and fish communities and we, we keep synthesizing that in various ways to come up with a coral reef condition index. And we can then plot those over time to see, and, and by island to see how systems are changing as we aggregate information. We've sense of all of that. We're working with the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program and the University of Maryland to develop a more sophisticated coral reef condition report card, where there they have kind of four indicator groups, uh, or uh, primary indicators, so for fish, for the benthic condition, uh, the climate drivers affecting that, and the, the human response to that. And for each of those, they have sub-indicators. So for like fish, there's, there's four indicators that go into the single fish indicator. Uh, for benthic, there's six indicators, et cetera. I won't go into all of those. And these are really for high-level reports. In August, we're supposed to be releasing reports for all five of the Pacific Island jurisdictions, these condition report cards. So those are really indicators of the status and trends of these systems. Another thing we're still struggling with is, is how to represent indicators of biological diversity. Most of what we focused on is focused on has been fish and corals. Uh, and those are shown in these upper two plots, and we're, we're sampling those very well, very well. And that's what these kind of asymptotic curves show. Uh, for the, and then together, fish and corals represent about 1% of the biodiversity of a reef. The other 99%, we've been developing tools over the last 
uh, over a decade to, to better characterize some of those other communities. And we're mostly undersampling those at, at, the, at the present time. We're trying to develop indices so we take the whole of the diversity of a place and we have to scale that so it's not completely dominated by the, the million microbial species or, 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 or whatever. So we scale it by what's possible for that particular functional unit. And now we're looking by island of, of some of these patterns and by archipelago of how much diversity, because that's a measure of resilience, is how much ecological uh, resilience you have, is how many different roles different organisms can play. So we're still working on that. Another part that we've, through collaborations with, with colleagues at San Diego State and, and University of Hawaii, that's very important for ecosystem function, that we, we generally don't manage microbes. But microbes really play the role of, of maintaining the function of many of these ecosystems. And in the next section, I'll talk about ecosystem models. And, and the foundation of these systems is, is these microbial communities. And we need to parameterize those well. So these collaborations are very, very helpful. They also are strong indices of the condition of the ecosystem itself is just from monitoring of the microbial community. So that's just some examples. So I, I just mentioned we're going to go next into ecosystem models. Several of the previous talks have, have talked about um, the modeling as ecosystem modeling aspects of uh, uh, fairly significant. I think the next one will also be that. So I'm only going to have a, a few slides on the, the ecosystem modeling work we use. And we use it as a, stool, a tool for management strategy evaluation. It enables us to examine in a, in, in a virtual way uh, di how different management actions may, may play out if they were implemented under, and under different climate scenarios. It gives us a tool to synthesize information across different uh, ways to identify thresholds or tipping points. So what are the most sensitive parts of the ecosystem? It, 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 it helps us evaluate what information we need. So Atlanta or uh, the Atlantis ecosystem model uh, was developed for the first time for a coral reef by Mariska Wagerman and numerous publications have come from this. But again, this was for a, a decision support to so the model itself and many others are on the call or are using Atlantis. It's a very complex ecosystem model. I'm not going to go into the details of the model. The, really, the point is that it allows us to look at different management strategies and see how they would play out in an ecosystem context, which would be the winners and to evaluate the trade-offs uh, in the model. So you can evaluate using full regulations, working focusing primarily on your watersheds, looking at, at various ways of managing fisheries, and then you can see how those play out in the model um, to, to the most benefit. So that's an application of the Atlantis model for Guam. More recently, um, Mariska and colleagues published a an ecosim or ecopath with ecosim model for the west coast of, of the Big Island, the, the Kona IEA or the West Hawaii IEA area, um, over a 15 year period from 2017 to 2032. So it incorporates climate change. Uh, Mariska, they, they broke it into kind of ecosystem services that are valued, uh, kind of dive tourism, because a lot of the, the tourism industry is interested in certain things, uh, and then the fishery concerns. So are these going to go up or down under different management scenarios? So I'm going to show a couple of those. So under everything the same kind of current management, but decreasing fishing by going to 90% of maximum sustainable yield, you have certain up. You could look at, well, what if we decreased 50% of the land-based sources of pollution? What would that do to the ecosystem? What if we only did no herbivore fishing, like that Kahakili example? What if we only used line fishing instead of any net fishing or any other fish. So again, none of these are, or, or whatever we went to no take MPAs and none of these is going to be perfectly right. But again, they give us and they give managers a way to evaluate various options that they have before actually making the management action. It's not going to be perfect, but it's a big step in, in helping evaluate the trade-offs that managers are faced with. So that's an example from the, the modeling side. And then the, the very final part of, of what I have is that we need to communicate science to a wide range of audiences. The, the, uh, the NOAA Core Reef Conservation Program kind of created with, with the University of Maryland this, what we call the wedding cake of, of communicating science for different audiences. So in terms of information density, the scientific community wants to know everything about everything. That's, that's the world we live in. This is where we also maintain our scientific credibility. We publish in the peer-reviewed and peer-reviewed literature. That's kind of all the scientific publications. 
Next, the management community. They're knowledgeable. They have scientific understanding, but they can't keep up with every paper. So these are the technical documents. And then as we go up this, the density of the information decreases, and more and more of this synthesis happens. That report card that I, I talked about is really for the highest level policymakers. They don't want to read a 500 page or even a 50 page. They, they need the information synthesized in a useful way to provide decision making uh, at, that, at that finer level. So that's kind of the model we're working towards. We're providing all of the information in these synthesis reports via, via the web, so they're publicly available, very transparent. This is the kind of example of the, the technical information for managers, these, these large reports. This one that says the cover of is actually a thousand page report. So it's essentially a, a visual representation of all of the information that we have. That's for a select audience. The managers need that, but not everybody needs that. Then we have kind of summary booklets that are more for the public and for communicating to the stakeholders. Um, but then there's the data itself. There's these report cards for the high level of this wedding cake to the policymakers. But not forgetting, we need to maintain our scientific integrity by getting these the, the processes we use, the approaches we use through scientific review, the, the, the peer review process, to learn what we're doing well, to learn what we're not doing well, so we can continue to improve and provide better science over time. So kind of in conclusion, we, we've produced lots of different types of products, publications, reports. Uh, we have, we've done that in various ways. Kind of going back to conclusion, if we go to not be afraid of EBM or EBFM, it's really we're just trying to balance human well-being and ecological well-being through good governance. It's, it's as simple as that uh, of what we're trying to do requires a lot of information, but you don't need to know everything about everything. You need to just do it and continually improve through adaptive management. Um, you, you, there's many different scales that we need to do ecosystem science and management. There's, there's different management boundaries from small little marine protected areas to marine managed areas to monuments to our entire EEZ to international fisheries. We have these responsibilities that cross all these ecosystems operate on different scales as well. So we, we need to do our science across these different scales. And then in final closing, we, we need to effectively communicate our science to these different stakeholders to support management. And I think that's uh, all I have. I hope, uh, hopefully we can have a, a, a good discussion uh, following. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent presentation. I really appreciate all that work and, and to your team who uh, provided additional information there too. I also want to send thanks to the, we have a transcription service right now, also transcribing everything you say, Rusty. So uh -oh. um, we've had a couple, <laughs> couple of questions about uh, just as people are sort of formulating some questions in their mind, um, people are asking about uh, whether this information will be available. Uh, there will be an audio and written transcription of this presentation available online at the NOAA library site probably within 48 hours is that roughly the time frame um, after the, today's presentation. So uh, if folks uh, want to share this with other folks, just let, let you know that you can get that at the uh, NOAA library website. Um, we are working towards making these presentations more accessible for a range of uh, people who need the additional uh, uh, services. So I appreciate everyone's patience with that. Uh, we do have a couple questions that have come in while you were talking. And Rusty, Anna is asking a question. She said that that's a fantastic summary of available knowledge. How is all this information being synthesized in a synergistic way for management? And what systems are in place to make that possible or impede use? And can you give some examples? Uh, excellent question. And and I, I, I what we're trying to do is synthesize the complex information in, in things like these ecosystem indicators and these report cards and synthesizing information uh, with these decision support tools uh, like these ecosystem models in, in Atlantis. And it's why we, we are focusing kind of a significant effort in, in, in kind of trying to have different products, information products for different levels of, of policymakers on the ground managers, et cetera. And we, in, in the process of developing things like those coral reef condition report cards, we are working directly with the stakeholders in each jurisdiction. And, and that's an iterative process, which is why they actually take a very long time to, to produce. If we were only providing the science in them, 
we could do that very quick. It's going back and forth with the managers of what's useful, um, how how is the a better way of communicating it, and and we can always improve on that. But that's the process we're using is is to engage with the managers um, through the process. What do you need? Uh, how can we communicate that? This is this is what the science says. Is there a better way to communicate that uh, to address the questions that you have? Did that? I'm not sure if that answered the question adequately. I think that does sound like you were on the right track with what she was asking. We have a few more. She says yes, thank you. We have a few more online questions. Uh, Anne is asking, did the listing status of the corals help or hinder EBM? I mean, that's certainly not a scientific question. I mean, um, but the, the I, I, I mean, it's probably more for the managers to to answer that on whether it's 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 helped or hurt. Um, from the science perspective, I I think it helps. Um, the it raises the visibility. It focuses what the questions are uh, in in conservation. It it puts uh, particularly in in NOAA fisheries, um, particularly for nearshore resources where our fishery, most of our fishery responsibilities are three miles out to 200 miles. Our ESA requirements are also including zero to three. So it, it increases our requirement. And, and as I talked about in, you know, even the fishery resources, they go back and forth around these, across these lines that we put on maps, these political jurisdictions. ESA doesn't kind of adhere to those. So it does bring increased attention to those, uh, to those components, to listed corals, but to corals generally and the role that those play at both as endangered species, but the role they play in providing critical habitat for many of the fishery resources that we manage. Okay, we have uh, two more questions from Heidi Doer. Heidi is asking, what is the role, if any, of citizen science in your program and what is the role of sharks, large jacks, and moray eels in the ecosystem function? Have you had the chance to investigate this based on your data and observations? The the first question was on kind of citizen science, and and there there is there are numerous uh, uh, programs for coral reefs, like like Reef Check, and in Hawaii we have Eyes on the Reef, and and they can provide information. At, at finer temporal resolution than we have the ability and the resources to do. As I mentioned, the surveys that we do are done every three years, so very coarse resolution temporally. So citizen science is a way to get some information in between. I mentioned that we're, we're in the process of transitioning towards using uh, structure for motion or photo mosaic imagery and automated image processing of, of coral reefs. As we do that, uh, we, we think there's going to be, if we can build a data pipeline um, and the tools that um, people anywhere, anywhere in the world could really take uh, uh, photographic images in a standardized way and build the tools for them just to connect their camera, probably via Wi-Fi, directly to this database and have that data automated image, we, we could greatly increase the number of observations, both spatially, uh, and which we're always spatially limited and temporally limited. And citizen scientists can, if we help build the tools for them, increase the information that supports management in, in ways like that. Um, on the, the second question, um, I'm not a, a complete expert on all of the various roles of all of the various taxa. We have various experts. I think you mentioned Maury Eels and I can't remember, some, something else, and, and jacks. So certainly uh, the, the jacks are a key driver as one of the apex predators uh, in, in many of the systems. And, and in some of the uh, areas where we work, the remote areas, we have very large populations of jacks. An example is the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, where where they are a, a dominant driver of that ecosystem. Um, in other areas, they're, they're also often easily uh, uh, fished down, like the main Hawaiian Islands. We, we see much smaller populations and much smaller sizes of the jacks. And, 
And we, we think that that plays a role through the food web. And that's where things like these ecosystem models can then tackle some of the questions. What are the, what are the, 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 the tropic interactions as you remove some of these uh, populations that relieve some of the pressure of the prey that they, so some populations actually go up of some things that normally are fed on by the, by the jacks or, or the, the more eels uh, in, in the, the benthic environments. Okay, we don't have any more questions right now. Rusty online, anyone in the room? Nope. Okay, no one here in Silver Spring. Uh, I think you have some folks in the room there, Rusty? Uh, yeah. Hey, I didn't know if there were any questions out there. We've got um, Mike Tosato, uh, a regional administrator for Pacific Islands region is, is here, and Mike Secchi, who's the Science Center director, are here, and uh, and Beth uh, Lumsden in, in our Fishery Resource and Monitoring Division are, right. are here in the room. You guys have any questions? They, they don't have any questions. They, they get to see this all the time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we don't have any other uh, questions coming in. Um, and you can see that Rusty has his uh, email there at the bottom of the uh, conclusion slide. So I'm sure Rusty will be happy to take any questions offline. From you and again, thanks to you and your team out there, Rusty. That was an excellent presentation, great attendance. Um, stay tuned for our next one, which again is May 9th, and I think Rusty ended on a good note, sort of a good lead-in for our next speaker, Howard Townsend, who will be talking a lot more about models and the tools that Rusty alluded to in his uh, towards the close of his presentation. So, um, same time, uh, same place, and uh, again, thank you again for all your efforts. Thanks, Thanks, Peg and Judith.